the most unusual story uh, to this day that I, I can ever recall. Uh, I was uh, working the night police beat, and so uh, the night that uh, Jack Kennedy came to Fort Worth, where he spent his last night alive uh, before going to Dallas on that faithful, faithful day, uh, I didn't get off work till 3 o'clock in the morning, and so I was asleep the next day when he was shot in Dallas. And my brother, who my mother had allowed to uh, be off work, uh, while she, uh, uh, to go, uh, uh, my mother allowed my uh, brother to uh, uh, miss school that day. He was in high school, so he could go down and see the president. So they had seen the president. My brother had actually shaken hands with him outside the uh, Hotel Texas uh, before he went to Dallas. And they had done that, and then they'd gone to eat. And, and by the time they got home, it came over the radio, he had been shot. So he came in and woke me up. <clears throat> I got up dressed. I was in a complete daze. I mean, we didn't know what had happened. You know, we didn't know if World War III had started because they'd closed off the borders with Mexico. This was at the height of the Cold War. We just didn't know. And the other part is we had never seen or, or had experienced any of these violent events like I'm sad to say we now sort of become used to uh, in America. But this was the first thing like this in a long, long time. When I got to the, uh, to the city desk, uh, it was in complete bedlam. And it just had come over the radio that the president had died. So I uh, was just trying to answer the phones, help answer the phones. And a woman uh, on the phone said, is there anybody there who can give me a ride to Dallas? And I said, well, lady, you know, we don't run the taxi service here. And besides, our president's been shot. And she said, yes, I heard it on the radio. I think my son is the one who shot him. It was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. Why in the world she would have called the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, we don't know to this day. But she did, just looking for a ride. So uh, the guy who was the auto editor of the paper uh, always uh, got a car to drive. The local car dealers would give him a car, and he'd road test it and then write a report on it for the, uh, uh, for the Sunday newspaper. These were always pretty good reviews. It was a free car, free gas. You can see how that worked. Uh, but anyways, uh, I had a Triumph sports car, and I knew I couldn't take her to Dallas. It was about a you know 45-minute ride. So I went to the... Uh, auto editor, his name was Bill Foster, asking him if he, what kind of car he had, and he said a Cadillac. And so the two of us took that Cadillac out to the address she had given me, and uh, we picked her up. I got in the back seat with her. Uh, he drove, and we drove her to Dallas. And uh, in those days, uh, there was no security to speak of. You looked like you belonged someplace. You generally could get in. Uh, I didn't even have a press card, uh, you know, I think for a lot of that time. and. Uh, so anyway, when we got to the Dallas police station, where I didn't go very often, uh, I, the first uniformed cop I saw, I said, is there some place, I'm, I said, I'm the one who brought Oswald's mother over here. Is there some place we can put her where these reporters won't be bothering her? We did that all the time. We never told people who we, are, we were unless they asked. And I always wore a snap brim hat, so I'd look like Dick Tracy or you know, look like a detective. And it, most of the time it worked. It certainly did that morning. And so we, uh, they found a little office for us. We uh, went in that office, and it, the great thing was there was a phone there. And, and this was long before the days of cell phones. A big part of being a reporter was finding a phone to call your story in. So I would go out in a hall, gather up information out there, and then go back to my little phone where she was, Mrs. Oswald was, and, and phone it in. Well, it was getting toward dark, and she said to me, do you think there's any way uh, that they'd let me talk to my son. And I said, well, I don't know. And so I went and asked uh, Captain Will Fritz, who was the uh, chief of homicide. And he said, well, I, I guess we could do that. And so we were all herded into a holding room off the jail. And I'm thinking, my God, I, you know, I'm going to interview this guy, or at least if he won't talk to me, I'll get to hear what he says to his mother. And uh, uh, we're waiting there, and finally a guy standing over in the corner said, who are you? And I said, well, who are you? And he said, uh, are you a newspaper man? And I said, well, aren't you? And he finally stopped me. He said, listen, son, said, I want to tell you something. He said, I want you to get out of here because he said, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. And I guess he was overstating it, but he might have meant it because he was really furious. And it turned out that he was an FBI agent who was doing what he was supposed to do. I mean, he was the first guy to ask me who I was. And so I excused myself, and uh, after that, I, I, uh, 
I went out into the hallway, of course. I didn't leave the police station. And uh, I, I always look back on it as the biggest story I almost got and didn't. But it is also, uh, even in the midst of the tragedy that was going on, which was overwhelming, for anyone to have that kind of an adventure, I don't know how you, in any other profession, uh, you could have something like that happen to you. And that's why I just love to be a reporter. It's uh, you never know where the next big story is going to come from. When I go out to talk to kids in journalism school, I, I, I said the first tip is always answer the phone. You know, you never know. You never know who might be on that phone. And to this day, I cannot let a phone ring. Now, my wife gets so mad at me. We're at home, and she always looks at the caller ID to see who it is. I can't. There's just some reflex in me. The first ring, I grab it and answer it. So I get the benefit of all those telemarketing people who who <laughs> have something they want to sell. Yeah. It, was a, it was a very revealing uh, interview, more revealing than I understood at the time. Uh, uh, Mrs. Oswald was crazy. She, she, she was, uh, had some sort of insanity. And, and I, she, she began talking about immediately about herself, and about how people would uh, give his wife money they'd feel sorry for, her, but no one would give anything to her and that she would starve to death. And it was so, just so shocking that I, I didn't even put some of it into the interview that I did with her. Uh, because he just, I thought, well, this poor woman's under such stress. Who could imagine the horror that she was going through? I think that had I quoted her uh, more directly and put more of her quotes into the newspaper, I think people would have learned a little earlier on what kind of person her son was and perhaps uh, had a better explanation for why he did what he did. I um, mean, she really had a screw loose. And uh, years after that, long after those days, and I'd already come to CBS, she would sometimes call me and want to know, is there, do you think CBS would pay me to do an interview? She had nothing on her mind but money, and uh, she lived out her days selling his clothes to souvenir hunters. I mean, she really was the, the old witch in this story, and uh, I think it had a lot to do with the kind of person her son turned out to be.